You may have noticed the world's most economically advanced countries outside of North America have great passenger rail service. Usually high speed, but even if it's just a regular intercity service, it's something that's frequent and reliable. Well, today we're going to shine a light on the sad state of intercity rail in the US, and it is going to be in the form of a top 10 list, just not really one we can be proud of. All about the travesty that is intercity passenger rail in the US, coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome down in the comments. Kind of doing my own thing this week though, and it'll be clear why later in the video. So here are some sample city pairs from the nations that comprise the G7. These are sort of cherry picked, but I wanted cities that aren't mega cities that are close enough together where you should see a lot of intercity travel. Note, I'm not even talking specifically about high speed rail today. The numbers I'm showing here are all trains, except in the case of Japan where I just gave up after I counted all the Shinkansen trains in the timetable. The thing I wanna to stress today is high speed rail is great and we should be building it, but just plain old vanilla intercity rail that's frequent and reliable is extremely useful too. And yeah, that frequent and reliable part is not a given in most of the US. This is partly because so many passenger rail lines operate on track that's owned and maintained by the freight railroads. The freight operators are supposed to give preference to passenger trains, but as a frequent Amtrak Cascades rider who's had the experience of being delayed for hours behind a freight train, more times than I can probably count, the freight railroads just don't always play nice. Anyway, I'm not gonna do a whole methodology section here. The idea is deceptively simple. This is the 10 passenger rail lines with the most weekday departures. And I'll explain as I go through because this wasn't that straightforward to put together. And I'm just gonna get right into it with the very obvious number one, which is the Northeast Corridor. And yeah, I'm doing corridors today. I could have done city pairs, but then I think we just would have ended up with 10 city pairs that are along the Northeast Corridor, which I think is a boring top 10 list, but I do have some interesting Northeast Corridor ideas on my topic list, so stay tuned. Anyway, this one's complicated, so what I'm gonna do is talk about the segment with the most frequency, which is New York to Philadelphia. And that is as it should be, given the analysis I did in my video on expanding Acela. You've got all kinds of services using this segment, the Acela and the Northeast Regional, of course, but also the Keystone, the Palmetto, the Carolinian, the Silver Star, the Silver Meteor, the Cardinal, and the Crescent. I'm sure I have a lot of foamers who watch this channel, so let me know if you think I missed anything. But this is about 50 trains a day in each direction. This is a good time to talk a bit about methodology. There's a sense in which Metro North's New Haven line is intercity because New Haven is a separate metro area from New York. And if you added up all the Northeast Corridor services and the New Haven line, you'd actually have a ton of frequency. The thing is though, I covered regional rail in a different video and I just don't wanna duplicate. So for this list, I made a judgment call to leave out services like the New Haven line and other regional rail lines that connect two different metro areas, like Caltrain for San Francisco and San Jose and Metrolink, which connects all the different metro areas that make up the greater polycentric LA region. Okay, so let's go to number 10 now and start counting down. This is actually a tie between three different corridors that run five trains a day. I've got the Pacific Surfliner between LA and San Diego, the Lincoln Corridor between Chicago and St. Louis, and the Downeaster between Boston North Station and Portland, Maine, and other points north. Number nine, six trains on the San Joaquin's line between Stockton and Bakersfield. It really does blow my mind that there are more trains between Stockton and Bakersfield 
than there are between LA Union Station and San Diego Santa Fe Depot. I mean, I guess you can take the Metrolink Orange County line to Oceanside. It's like five trains a day and transfer to the coaster, but that's ridiculous. California, what are we doing? Number eight, the Amtrak Hiawatha between Chicago and Milwaukee, seven trains each weekday. This is another one that just doesn't make that much sense to me. I mean, outside the Northeast Corridor, this seems like it should be just about the busiest conventional passenger rail line in the US, just based on city size and proximity. Maybe LA San Diego should have more? Man, I'm just struggling to get over that. I've got a two-way tie for sixth with 10 trains a day. I've got the Empire Service, which connects America's largest city to its state capital. So yeah, that one makes sense. And then I've got, also with 10 trains each weekday, the New Mexico Rail Runner between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So here's where you're gonna get a deep dive because I was actually in New Mexico this week so I could ride this beauty myself and I'm just gonna walk through it. First of all, if you're a legit transportation nerd, you'll catch the bus from the airport to Alvarado Transportation Center, which is where the Railrunner's downtown Albuquerque platform is. It's bus 50 and it runs every 30 minutes. In other words, the same frequency as the SEPTA airport line in Philly. Please make it make sense. I guess the difference here is Route 50 only takes 15 minutes to get downtown and it's free as is all transit in Albuquerque right now. Okay, so you get to the platform and these are either two or three car double-decker trains. So we aren't talking high capacity, but it's 10 trains a day. And how much capacity do you need between a metro area of 900,000 and a metro area of 150,000? You hop aboard, the train departs right on the minute, which I'll talk about in a bit and it makes the roadrunner sounds when the doors are closing. So cute. So you've got these two level bombardier coaches and you definitely want the upper deck for the scenery. Albuquerque can be a little gritty, but gritty is okay. And the scenery as you start gaining elevation towards Santa Fe gets pretty spectacular and the weather conditions can change pretty dramatically. Glad I wasn't driving in this stuff. The interior is, well, it's a train. But to me, this is why rail is good, even if it isn't high speed. I mean, look at it. I can get a crap load of work done because there's plenty of elbow room and the ride is smooth. I can walk around and stretch my legs. I can spread out because the train is probably never gonna be full. You hear arguments, why not just run buses on the highway instead of using all this expensive infrastructure? Well, none of the things I just mentioned are things I can do on a bus. The runtime is about an hour 40, although they do run an express that saves you 10 or 15 minutes. So it's not necessarily competitive with driving, but say you're an Albuquerque-based lawyer working on a case up in Santa Fe, man, you could get a lot of billable work done. I could never figure out why this train didn't feature more in the Breaking Bad universe. Just a big misstep by the New Mexico Tourism Board. As you get north, there's some density around the Santa Fe stations, and the rail yard district around the end of the line at Santa Fe Depot is a lot of fun. If you're into like craft beer or distilleries or movies or hiking equipment or say, Game of Thrones, this district has you covered. The rail runner literally pulls in right next to the George R. R. Martin dragon train. So you might ask, why are we spending money on 10 trains a day between cities that are this modestly sized when there are so many more promising city pairs all over the country? Well, it's because New Mexico got its politics together and decided to spend the money and your state didn't. In 2003, Governor Richardson and the state legislature passed a transportation funding package that included the rail runner and construction of the line into Santa Fe was completed in 2008. 
And my understanding is the state literally bought the trackage from BNSF so it could ensure the rail runner's priority and reliability, and that's a huge deal. The pandemic hit rail runner hard, and after a brief shutdown, they slashed fares by 75%. Ridership increased about 88%, and then citing high gas prices, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham announced that the reduced fares would be extended until the end of 2022. The upshot is I paid $2.25 each way for a train ride to Santa Fe and back, which is all I paid for transportation on my entire trip. I mentioned all the transit in Albuquerque is free, and that does include the ART, possibly the best BRT line in the US and probably the subject of a future video. What I'm saying is, and this is also probably the subject of a future video, this is a great destination if you're looking for a car-free vacation. And that includes biking too, which is not bad in Albuquerque or Santa Fe. There's been a lot of criticism that the rail runner doesn't pay for itself. It runs at a deficit, maybe $10 million a year. And you hear criticisms that it's some kind of albatross that hamstrings the state DOT's ability to construct roadway projects, which last I checked also don't pay for themselves. Do people really think through this stuff before they talk about it? Building a cool rail service and foregoing roadway expansion at the same time sounds kind of win-win to me. Maybe New Mexico just has it all figured out. Okay, end rant on the economic feasibility of rail. Number five is the capital corridor between Sacramento and Oakland, 11 trains a day. This one isn't a surprise. I'll give a kind of meh honorable mention to the Altamont Corridor Express between Stockton and San Jose, just four trains a day. Number four is the keystone between Philadelphia and Harrisburg. Kind of double dipping here because the Keystone is also part of the Northeast Corridor segment I already talked about, but Philly to Harrisburg is a completely separate corridor. There's definitely a theme here with Sacramento and Albany and Santa Fe. Connections to state capitals, which there is a perverse logic to it if you think about the politics of how service gets funded. Okay, while you're pondering where we're going for numbers two and three, I do have some dishonorable mentions and other errata. But first, brief pause to ask you to drop a like on the video and subscribe if you think trains are cool. Connect on the apps. I'm not quite ready to include a Mastodon link yet, but I'm getting there. Direct support via Patreon is super appreciated. And sub count check. The channel now has enough subscribers to fill Bryant-Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa, home of the Alabama football team. Yeah, they got a name for the winners in the world, but the state of Alabama isn't winning any urbanism awards from this channel. Just a thought though, you could honestly fund a high-speed rail network all over the southern U.S. just from the massive gate receipts and broadcast revenues from these amateur sporting events where the athletes don't even get paid. Sort of an honorable mention to South Florida where Brightline runs like 16 trains a day and Tri-Rail runs 25 or so on a different alignment. It's just that even though West Palm Beach and Miami are like 70 miles apart, they're in the same metropolitan statistical area, so I couldn't put them on this list. Still good services though, at least for the US. Dishonorable mention, I already mentioned LA to San Diego, which I'm just never going to get over. It's like a whopping five trains a day. And I made passing reference to San Antonio to Austin. I'm also going to give you Phoenix to Tucson. Phoenix doesn't really have intercity rail at all. I'll give you Las Vegas to anywhere, definitely LA. There used to be the desert wind, and maybe we'll get Brightline West at some point. And I'd throw in things like Atlanta to Athens and Columbus, Ohio to basically anywhere. It's amazing the cities we have that just don't have any kind of intercity rail service at all. Okay, back to it. Number three is the Hartford line. 18 trains a day between Hartford and New Haven, including things like the Valley Flyer and the Vermonter. 
And guess what? Another connection to estate capital. Anyway, Alan Fisher did a recent video on electrifying the Hartford line and the Empire line. And I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. It's good stuff. And number two is Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, or SMART. This is a weird one that probably calls into question the validity of this entire list, but you know what? That's okay. The whole point of this video was really to share cool footage from New Mexico. Anyway, is this a commuter line or an intercity line? I don't know. I mean, if you're commuting from Sonoma County to San Francisco, it dumps you at Larkspur, and then you still have to take a ferry if you want to get into the city. In a way, this one's even more amazing than the New Mexico Railrunner Express. People who know this line, let me know what's going on here. Is this wine country tourism, or is it super commuters? Both, maybe? You know, for me, the more ridership generators you have in both directions, the better. There is no bad rail. And that's all I got. Thanks for tuning in this week. And thanks to the patrons for helping to fund a New Mexico expedition, which included a truly inadvisable number of chili pepper-based dishes. I swear, I'm gonna start a food channel next year. I do hope to get out to more cities in 2023, and the support really helps. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new installment next week, and I'll see you then.